reality, captured in user-friendly symbols and processed for understanding. The Idea Channel. How many times a day does the government step into your life? Few of us stop to count, but our homes and jobs are affected by literally thousands of federal, state, and local regulations. In a few minutes, we'll see a short drama that helps bring this point home. Keep in mind while you watch that you and I asked for this regulation. Some now feel it has gone too far, but public demand created the growing number of laws protecting consumers, workers, and the environment. These controls didn't just spring up overnight in the bureaucratic barnyard. In many cases, there's a clear need for protection. You can't measure the amount of radiation coming out of your television set, so the government does that for you. But what about advertisements and programs the TV set brings into your home? Should a regulator decide what you and your children can safely watch? It's tough to know where to draw the line, and even tougher to try and figure out how much we're paying for government regulation. Are we getting our money's worth? No one questions the need for clean air, worker safety, and consumer protection. But some experts have concluded that there must be more effective ways to reach these goals. In a few minutes, I'll have two guests with whom I'll be examining these questions. But first, our dramatization. Meet Fred Polino and his wife, Sally. Two kids, a mortgage, and a cat. Not exactly average, 35% of a car and a third of a kid less than average. But from the minute they get up, Fred and Sally will share something in common with us all. And like most of us, they won't stop to think about it much. Get up, Sally. Mm -hmm. Get up, get the kids up. Oh, the kids are probably already up watching television. Um, well, why don't you get up and watch it with them, Sally? Oh, what you turn the light on for? <laughs> Do go get started in the bathroom and I'll get breakfast started. Okay. Where's the bathroom? That way. Thanks. Everybody loves somebody sometime. Ooh, not bad, Fred. Mm-hmm. Love somehow. Everybody loves something. And your kiss just for me. Oh, my sometime. Damn it! I'll be well tomorrow. Fred has only been up a couple of minutes, and already he's bumped into at least three government regulators. Sally, even though she worries about the effect TV has on her kids, is too busy fixing breakfast to pay any attention to the federal agencies that control the programs, the ads, and the radiation level her children are exposed to. Your kids are a little bit too close to TV. Move back, please. You ready for your coffee now? And your sugar. The number of government regulators in the house is growing, but no one has noticed, except Fred. I think she's trying to do away with me. Use of this product may be hazardous to your health. This product contains saccharin, which has been determined to cause cancer in laboratory animals. 
Maybe I shouldn't use this. Oh, what the heck. Tuna fish okay today? Oh, yeah. Lots of mayonnaise. Okay. By the time Fred gets out of the house each morning, his safety and health have either been protected or policed, depending on your point of view, by a fair-sized army of government regulators. Let's see what's waiting for him at work. According to the plant manager here, nothing but clean steam comes out of those smokestacks now. The paper company Fred works for recently spent $62 million on pollution control devices. Not only that, it costs more than $1 million a year just to maintain the new equipment. earmuffs Fred is wearing are fairly cheap, about $7 a pair. Trouble is, Fred and the other paper workers near this machine don't always use this protection. In the summer, they can get pretty hot. One way around the problem, the government figures, is to make the machines quieter. It's an expensive proposition. American business firms estimate they'll spend $10 million to comply with anti-noise laws. Hey, hi, Maureen. Hi, how, you, how you doing? How's the check look? Looks good. A lot of overtime. Uh, you this know week. what that means? What? You and I are weekend in Bethel Park. Promises, promises. I know. How's the South Belt? Pretty good. Ronnie Pasanka hit a home run last night. Fantastic. Oh, we're going to win the league. I hope so. See you, Maureen. Bye. Hey, good luck on the application. Yeah, I hope so. There are over 80 regulatory agencies at the federal level alone, and more than 100,000 government workers are busy every day enforcing their rules. But next year, the total cost of enforcing and obeying government regulations will top $100 billion. That puts one side of the issue hard, sharp, and clear. Perhaps my guests can help us decide whether we're getting our money's worth or not. With me to talk about government regulations are George Stiegler, professor of economics at the University of Chicago, director of the Center for the Study of the Economy, and editor of the Journal of Political Economy, and Mark Green, a longtime associate of Ralph Nader, director of the Citizens Lobby Congress Watch, and author or editor of eight books on government regulations and business. One of the things that didn't quite come out, I think, in the film we just watched, was the fact that there are really many more kinds of regulation and regulatory agencies than were mentioned there. There is what you might call the old style of regulation, things like the Interstate Commerce Commission and the Federal Trade Commission, that are really concerned with economic goals, having to do with the size and concentration of, of, of business. And then there are the newer style regulatory agencies, things like the Environmental Protection Agency or the Food and Drug Administration or the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. These are the kinds of things that were being referred to there, which are aimed at newer social goals having to do with health and safety and the environment. 
Can we really talk about these two types of regulation in the same breath? Are the problems more or less the same, or are they quite different? I think actually they're quite different. <clears throat> the first kind that you mentioned I, I call cartel regulation. It's when the government often frustrates competition in the trucking industry, in the airline industry. They can be quite competitive. Uh, consumers can understand buying a lower-priced air ticket if they had the choice. Instead, the government often lets the airlines or the railroads, for example, act like a cartel and with government sanction, price fix, frustrate entrance, allow mergers. Here the marketplace could work. In the health and safety area that you mentioned, which is by and large the agencies created in the 1960s and 1970s, often the market can't work because while a consumer can understand the difference in price, they can't smell, taste, or touch the carbon monoxide that may be coming into their compartment of their car. They can't test a drug before it's marketed. Here the public expects and understandably expects that what they're buying is safe because they're not a laboratory. Would you agree with that distinction? In a broad way, although I think you can press it too far uh, on two scores. One is that uh, if there are rules about regulation in the past, such as that the Interstate Commerce Commission became independent of the passengers and of the shippers and became primarily dependent on the transport media, how do we know that the new regulations won't become independent of what consumers want? That's, that's a generic problem in public regulation. You mean the problem with the old-style regulators, it's often said, is that, that they've been taken over by those that are, who are supposed to be regulated. Yeah. Yeah. You're concerned that that could also happen in the newer areas of They're regulation. They're less likely to be taken over unless it's by particular groups that lead the, the public interest uh, lobbies of one sort or another, but, but they can become autonomous. They can say, we set the goals and, and it's not public consideration. I say, that's a problem. I don't know how cute that'll be, but it's a potential problem. And the other thing is that it's a little odd to say that um, the protection of people from unreliable and unsafe things, for example, is, is a new function undertaken by government. It's an ancient function undertaken by economic systems. And automobiles got better between 1900 and 1965 before we had federal regulation. So in a sense, there's been a displacement of the market where the market did a fair amount uh, of good in the past. I won't press that in the field of pollution, but I would in a field like uh, a product safety. Well, are you saying that really there are some areas in, the, in which the market does not work well, that in most areas the market does, but in some areas it doesn't, and that government regulation should really be more narrowly confined to those areas where the marketplace doesn't work for one reason or another? Well, that's certainly the, a, a, a legitimate position. I, I accept that. I do think that that it is impossible on, on grounds of personal decisions to, to remove automobile pollution. If I spend $5,000 more on my car to make it the, the cleanest car that had ever been driven, the benefits that came to me or the people I know would be negligible. They're dissipated over the entire communities which through, I, through which I drive. So in that sense, I do think there are functions that only the government can undertake. They aren't as long a list, in my opinion, as in almost anybody else's opinion. Well, I would contest one of your examples. Uh, you said in product safety, car safety area, you wouldn't agree as you would the pollution area. Uh, since 1966, when the Auto Safety Agency was created, <clears throat> auto deaths per miles driven has gone down 25%. 10,000 people a year are alive because that agency exists requiring performance standards and safety standards on cars. In fact, this year, the Department of Transportation issued a rule requiring passive restraints, which probably will mean airbags in your car, so that in the 1980s, when the car stops dead, the passenger doesn't. He, he, hits, he or she hits this, this cushion. Best estimate? 9,000 lives a year, 63,000 well, lives a year. But doesn't some of those, that reduction in, in deaths, have something to do with the 55 mile an hour speed limit, which was put in for quite different reasons? Oh, the 55 mile hour speed limit is part of it. That is a fantastic example of government regulation. Well, that's a question, because if you die in a traffic jam rather than in an accident, there's, there's a marginal dis decision. But I think you're being too kind. The, the decline in automobile accidents per million miles driven has been going on for a long time. There was a reversal from 1960 to 65 because we got a lot of young drivers because of the bulge in the 20-year-olds the who have to learn how to drive through one accident or more. Uh, so that I don't think in the long-term trend that, that you can get anywhere near that much credit to the regulation. Indeed, let me just add one striking case. Sam Peltzman, a colleague of mine, did a study which suggests that 
As a result of cars being safer with seat belts and, and uh, mask dashboards and things like that, we now drive with a little more blindness and that what really happened is that automobile drivers live longer, but pedestrians don't live as long. One thing that, one question that's related to what we've been, just been talking about is that a number of the regulatory agencies have a standard which says that the number of injuries or the amount of pollution or whatever it is they're concerned with should be reduced to the minimal level that is technically feasible, the best, the lowest possible level with present technology. But is that necessarily what's socially desirable? That is, it, there's a contrast between that kind of very tough standard and the way we behave in our private lives. The fact is that all of us could lead healthier and safer lives than we apparently choose to in terms of what we eat and how much we exercise and so forth. Should we have one standard for our private that's implicit in our private behavior and another tougher standard in our government regulation? Well, my reaction to that is that, that we really do improve in both directions as we get richer. I think it's proper for a rich society to buy clean air and nice water and lovely scenery on the, uh, uh, in the countryside, just as it's, it's proper for a family to have a, a more spacious home and one that's cleaner and things like that. When you set absolute goals, they're always kind of silly, I think. Uh, if you told me that um, I could have absolutely pure water but that at a price of, say, $5 a gallon, and it would be slightly less pure at 10 cents a gallon, I would well hesitate over making that final step. And the society has to say, rich as we are, that, that there are obviously very finite limits to what we can afford to buy. Well, I, I agree with that. Someone has said that <clears throat> regulation should focus on the whales, not the minnows. So you shouldn't require that cowboys drag along a toilet bowl seat OSHA reputedly required that for safety reasons. Instead, the Occupational Health and Safety Agency should focus on brown lung disease, where a third of the industry inhales it, and it's a very debilitating uh, disease. You should, in a society of scarce resources, where the public has a certain tolerance and expectation of government regulation, uh, fulfill it where the most lives are saved and not in frivolous ways. That one about brown lung disease is rather interesting because it hasn't been very long since there was really a tremendous pulling and hauling going on in the, in, in the administration. Apparently between the Secretary of Labor and the head of OSHA and the labor unions, particularly in the textile industries, mm -hmm. who favored a very tight standard on uh, dust in textile factories, and apparently the Council of Economic Advisors, who favored a less tight standard on the grounds that the tight standard would be highly inflationary. It seems to me that's kind of casting into sharp relief the kind of trade-offs this whole regulatory area involves. That was an interesting example because some of the economists, like Barry Bosworth, who was sort of an inflation fighter, uh, young economist, I don't think he's worked in a factory recently, his suggestion, let them wear gas masks. That is, instead of regulating the factory, have the workers wear a gas mask for 10 hours a day in a hot factory. He should experience factory living before he comes up with very abstract cost-benefit analyses. And that's the danger with analyses like that. You're often the government is often dependent on industry data, which is not unbiased, which is exaggerated often. And they, don't, they focus on the costs so much more than the victims often. And the victims, the 10,000 people that didn't die this year because of auto safety, they don't know they didn't die. Now, if they could organize an incredibly, indescribably powerful lobby group, but they're unknowing beneficiaries. So we have to be cautious of an inevitable tilt away from the victims of regulation and benefiting the businesses who exaggerate the costs of regulation. You're saying, I gather, in other words, it's not just how much do we pay, but also how much are the benefits that we get from it, and that that may be pretty hard to measure or to quantify. But I can give you a counterexample to that. I'm told, I hope I was told correctly, that in the case of noise abatement, where we saw the worker in that, that film wearing these ear uh, coverings, that you can do it that way for, let's say, $30,000 a worker in, in very noisy businesses like the making mm -hmm. of, of boilers and the like, and that to do it through the production process might take billions. In a case like that, my inclination would be to try the cheap way voluntarily, to go up to the worker and say, would you wear earmuffs or a gas mask for $8,000 more a year? Uh, and if they say yes, gladly, well then it seems to me that's a more efficient method of, of proceeding. It's economizing and getting the same goal, but I'd make it voluntary. I wouldn't make it coercive. 
But you'd really have to give them the 8,000 well, extra, course, presumably. Of course, that's right. I guess one yeah. of the things that, that people find troublesome is that in the area of occupational safety, for instance, there's this incredible number of regulations, and people make all kinds of jokes about the number of regulations mm -hmm. relating to the size and shape of a ladder. And at the same time, there are really dangerous workplaces, like coal mines, for instance, where they seem to be still just as dangerous as ever. I'm, but they've been I, regulated federally for 100 years almost. And, and I guess that's the question. Um, but not well, and that is the question. <laughs> how well, with how many resources? OSHA is often ridiculed and lampooned because of their Mickey Mouse regulations. <clears throat> and it's part of sort of the anti-big government, one could say, fad. Um, the uh, Proposition 13 in California um, recently sort of is, was a kick in the groin of government. But I don't see people laughing after the scaffolding collapse in West Virginia. Fifty-one men fell to their death. And Eula Bingham, the head of OSHA, later said, I have just so many people. If I could have inspected that site, we may have spotted the problem. So in this instance, fewer regulators meant more deaths. And the question, of course, is where do you draw the line? But it's not a simple anti-government, pro-government issue. It's, it's, it's quite much more complex. Although I suppose there is a question also of is it fewer regulators or should they be better deployed? Well, but if you ask yourself how many people would be necessary to inspect all scaffolds, it, it would be an, a, a force that would really frighten you. And it seems to me, again, I want to repeat my thesis that you can get an awful lot out of people by, by, by monetary incentives. If, for example, the tort law responsibility of, of the employers in that case was very severe, so each of those workers cost <clears> two <throat> or three hundred thousand dollars. Then the incentives you build into the construction industry are, are really what are going to produce the, the protection. Um, the, the tort system breaks down in a lot of cases. When you're producing a product which may cause cervical cancer in your daughter, if you're taking in the uh, additive DES, in 20 years, or may cause a deteriorative or cancer Cancer, cancerous disease in, disease in 40 years. Tracing back the cause and the, and the penalties are quite, quite impossible. There was a book called In the Name of Profit, edited by Robert Heilbrunn, a well-known economist. And he showed examples of where you would have thought the company would say, if we're caught, there'll be a tremendous penalty, so let's not do it. There's a momentum institutionally to go ahead to cut costs, to produce the drug that may not be dangerous, even though a scientist has told you up the ladder that it might be dangerous. And too often we've seen companies who have violated health and safety laws. But isn't there a risk there in both directions? That is, clearly yeah. there's a risk of producing mm -hmm. a drug which is unsafe or ineffective or ca causes real harm. But inevitably, on the other side, isn't there the concern that if you regulate very stringently the drug producing industry, there are some drugs which might help people or even save that's, lives that's that point. will come later. That's, that's called that. the, the drug lag point. Mm -hmm. And it's a very powerful one now. Yeah, actually, the Food and Drug Administration says that they know of no drug that's marketed abroad that is help, that would increase safety and health that's not marketed here. That but, can't you know, be true. but you know what I would like to see, and here we might agree, if a drug company wants to market a drug that is, um, they think, a, a penicillin, and others are anxious about its safety, if they would accept absolute liability for any injury that results in an experimental period, that might be tolerable. They wouldn't want to do that, though. They're anxious there about the tort liability. Hence, the Food and Drug Administration is quite strict to avoid the thalidomides of the future, as it avoided thalidomide a decade and a half ago. And to postpone the penicillins of the future. We know they stopped thalidomide. You're guessing they stopped penicillin. Well, but the, that's inherent, isn't yeah, it? That is, there is always this problem. There's a long list of these. I, in spite of what you say, uh, there's a Professor Wardell at, at Rochester who just completed a big study for the National Science Foundation. And that suggests that now England is the primary drug producing country. And they have d uh, four or five times as many drugs as we have new drugs that are available to the public. So that I think there are real costs in carrying this too far. That doesn't mean I'm in favor of impure drugs, but I don't know that the tort system fails to give a, a large pharmaceutical company every incentive to be careful in its experiments. By the tort system, you mean essentially the legal liability that That's a right. company well, may have after the fact. To anyone it injures, yeah. Let me ask a question now about these efforts that are going on, and there are efforts going on, despite all the jokes, to rationalize the regulatory process. OSHA, the Occupational Self Safety and Health Agency, and the Health Educational Welfare Department, and so on, are making an effort to get rid of foolish and trivial regulations. 
Do you think that this kind of marginal change can make much difference or make the process significantly more effective, or is it going to take something more dramatic and radical than that? Uh, that's the main place where Mark and I may disagree. His group has done lots of excellent studies criticizing O-line agencies. And the trouble is that normally the way he wants to solve the problem is to create either a new agency or a new set of people with a new mandate and with more power and more resources. And my inc inclination is to say history hasn't been very kind to that method of dealing with the problem. And I constantly want to see if I can't build incentives in for private conduct to achieve these social goals. I don't really know how to go up to OSHA year in and year up, out and say, be sensible and stick to the important payoffs and, and, and don't be frivolous and, and don't really worry about trifles. Uh, you know, that's an admonition that doesn't carry any weight or any power. And if somehow built into the bureaucratic system is a love of detail, uh, how do I get rid of it? I, I think that's uh, visionary in a certain sense. You could construct a system where you wake up in the morning and you give the consumer the choice of 0.4 or 0.7 nitrites in the bacon, or, or 1 or 1.5 uh, current for electricity into the alarm clock that we saw. Uh, but uh, all you would have then is a, is, a, is a daily ballot of a thousand decisions a day. Instead, consumers want decisions that they can understand. They want be, to be free. They also want to be free from uh, pollution or unnecessary uh, danger. And it could work in certain instances like your um, earmuffs for noise reduction. That makes more sense than gas masks for reduction of inhalation of dangerous par particulates. It depends on the price. At 50000 a year, I'd lecture through a gas mask. We just have a couple of seconds left. Do you think that a notion of sunset rules on regulations, as President Carter has recently suggested, would do any good? I really don't think so, uh, because my anxiety is that what agencies will be sunsetted? The agencies that have strong corporate constituencies, like the Federal Maritime Commission, or health and safety agencies where poor people are hurt and they're unorganized often. I think the latter, so I'm suspect of it. Thank you for a lively session. I think it's clear by now that government regulation is not an issue of good versus evil. Actually, it's often a case of good versus good, especially when we're dealing with a new breed of rules that reflect our changing social values. The tricky part is striking the right balance among competing goods. Difficult trade-offs are involved. Remember, the price tag includes more than bureaucrat salaries, increased production expenses, and higher consumer prices. There's also the cost of what might have been, the jobs, goods, and services that are lost or delayed because of government red tape. But that's just one side of the story. The risk of getting rid of a given regulation may well be measured in human lives, health, or the quality of our environment. No matter which way we go, we run into what economists call opportunity cost. Loosely translated, that means there is no such thing as a free lunch. I'm Marina Whitman. Thanks for watching. Economically Speaking is a production of WQLN Public Communications, which is solely responsible for its contents.